Now, worldview, this was hinted at already by Professor Spencer. Everybody has one. Okay, you may not have thought about it too much, but each of us has one based on our, our own experiences. And uh, a carefully thought out worldview reflects the deep hunger among human beings for an overarching framework to bring unity to their lives. What does this lecture have to do with my research? We have been working on interstellar molecules for a long, long time. Our first uh, paper in this area was published in Nature, uh, one of the two most prestigious scientific journals in the world, and you can see a little bit of it. It's on um, the HCO plus molecule in interstellar space. And our last paper was, this is interesting, this paper is, has been pub is published and already has a November 2018 date. So this is visionary. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever published a paper before, before the date came. Uh, but that's the way the Royal uh, Astronomical Society functions. Um, so cosmology is the big picture, the study of the universe as a whole, its structure, origin, and development. The questions cosmology addresses are profound, both scientifically and more generally speaking. And Rather than try to define cosmology, let's ask some of the questions that, uh, that are asked by cosmology. First, is the universe finite or infinite in content and extent? Most important for us this evening, is the universe eternal or did it have a beginning? Was the universe created? If not, how did it get here? Uh, and, and a little bit more of this. Uh, if so, if the universe was created, how was this accomplished? And what can we learn about the agent and events of creation? And I don't want to go through all these. Uh, so these are pretty good questions, though. Uh, are such laws, the laws of physics, the products of chance or something more profound? Uh, that we're not going to get into. Uh, or that. Yeah, okay. So we'll, many of these questions we will think about. Okay? Now, the idea that the universe has a, had a specific time of origin has been philosophically resisted by some highly distinguished scientists. Arthur Eddington, who experimentally confirmed uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity in 1919, stated a dozen years later, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Uh, Einstein himself, his reaction to the consequences of his own general theory of relativity, appears to acknowledge um, the threat of an encounter with God. Uh, through the equations of general relativity, it's not that hard to trace the origin of the universe backward in time to some sort of a beginning. However, before publishing his cosmological inferences, Einstein introduced a cosmological constant, a fudge factor if you like, to yield a static model for the universe, a model in which the universe is infinitely old. He did later consider this to be the most serious mistake of his, one of the very few mistakes, I should say, of his scientific career, and ultimately gave grudging acceptance to what he called the necessity for a beginning, and eventually to what he called the presence of a superior reasoning power. But he did not accept the reality of a personal God, a God who is concerned about each person in this auditorium. Five arguments for the existence of God. We're not going to spend too much time with, with these. We're only going to talk about one, okay? So if you're in philosophy, you'll have to get the others from the classroom. Uh, just this one, the cosmological argument. It's, it's in Aquinas, it's in Augustine, in many, many places. The effect of the universe's existence must have a suitable cause. We're going to skip all the others. There they are. They're interesting. Uh, but we want to talk about the one. Why such strong resistance to the idea of a beginning for our universe. Well, it basically comes down to the cosmological argument. Let's try to divide it into three parts first. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. This is what keeps science going, cause and effect. Secondly, now, supposing the universe, our universe, began to exist, then the universe must have a cause. And I think you can see that this line of argument could be moving in a direction that might be uncomfortable for some. Uh, Robert Dickey, Princeton physicist, said a long time ago that an infinitely old universe 
would relieve us of necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any time in the past. And he desperately needed relief from uh, this problem. Uh, now this is the most um, outrageous statement. Let me not uh, say that. This is the strongest statement I've heard on this topic. Walter Ernst, discoverer of the third law of thermodynamics, made this statement. To deny the infinite duration of time would betray the very foundations of science. Obviously, Nernst dreamed of a universe that was infinitely old and uh, spoke of this with great confidence. Simon Singh, in his little book, The Big Bang, uh, published a few years back, talks about this. And actually, he raises the question, which several others have raised as well, is the Big Bang Theory a Christian conspiracy? And this, he talks about Fred Hoyle, and I'll quote Fred Hoyle uh, later. Um, I've been talking to this young man in the front row quite a bit here. What's your name again? Derek. Derek, yeah. He, he doesn't believe in God, but we're, I told him I'd try to say something about this, so he's going to grade me when we're done. Uh, <laughs> Fred Hoyle, who we talk about, was scathing when it came to the Big Bang's association with religion, condemning the Big Bang theory as a model built on Judeo-Christian foundations. For his entire life, Fred Hoyle believed the universe to be infinitely old. Stephen Barr, professor of physics at the University of Delaware, good, good physicist, kind of summarizes what I've tried to say in these first couple slides. He said, the historical fact is that Christians believed in the beginning of time while scientific materialists strongly preferred the idea of an ageless universe. Ageless universe, uh, not needing a cause. In 1946, George Gamow, Russian-born American scientist, proposed that the fi primordial fireball, or Big Bang, was an intense concentration of pure energy. It was the source of all the matter that now exists in our universe. The Big Bang theory predicts that all the galaxies in the universe should be rushing away from each other at high speeds as a result of that initial Big Bang. 1965, observation of the microwave background radiation by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, Bell Telephone Labs, convinced most scientists the validity of the Big Bang theory. Uh, further ob observations, which I'll mention, beginning in 1992, have moved the Big Bang theory from a uh, consensus view to one almost nearly unanimous view among cosmologists. There was an origin to the universe perhaps 13.7 billion years ago. A definition, the hot Big Bang theory, states that the entire physical universe, all the matter and energy, and even the four dimensions of space and time, burst forth from a state of infinite or near infinite density, temperature, and pressure. Quite an extraordinary set of circumstances. Indeed, a singularity. Arno Penzias, um, six months before he got the Nobel Prize, maybe eight months before he got the Nobel Prize, uh, was, um, was quoted in the New York Times. This is Penzias and Wilson, discovers the microwave uh, background radiation, said this. The best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible, as a whole. Controversy comes in here immediately. I mean, it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, so this is uh, six months before his Nobel Prize. Here they are. Penzias is uh, on, uh, on the left, uh, Wilson on the right. They're, they're uh, standing, uh, of course, they're old, distinguished scientific administrators now. Uh, thankfully, a fate that has never befallen me. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, or none of you, I hope, either. Terrible. But uh, this, is their, this, is, this is the apparatus with which they observe the, the, the uh, micro background radiation. And uh, Penzias hasn't changed his mind about these, these things over the years. He's still with us. Uh, when he was asked uh, nearly 20 years later why some cosmologists were so affectionate in their embrace of an infinitely old universe, Penzias replied this way, well, People are uncomfortable with the notion of purpose. To come up with things that contradict purpose, they tend to speculate about things they haven't seen. So pretty strong position here. Dennis Chama it comes into our story uh, in a couple of ways. He comes in right here because he, in my mind, was the most distinguished 
of all those who believed in the steady state hypothesis, the idea that the universe is infinitely old. And secondly, uh, he was the thesis advisor of Stephen Hawking, who we're gonna, gonna uh, talk about. Um, yes, he gave up on the steady state hypothesis, and he did so in front of a bunch of television cameras and really in a, a rather clever way. This is how he did it. He said, the steady state theory has a sweep and beauty, a lot of this due to himself, uh, that for some unaccountable reason, the architect of the universe appears to have overlooked. <laughs> this is a tremendous explanation of any failure in science. You know, I just had a great idea and God didn't like it. It's just too bad. Uh, I have had some great ideas that God didn't like. I'm not innocent in this respect. Uh, uh, okay, 1992, uh, George Smoot, scientific team leader, received the Nobel Prize in Physics for this work 14 years later. Smoot and I were classmates together at MIT. Um, we never thought he was gonna get the Nobel Prize. Uh, he was famous for something else at MIT, which I don't really have time to tell you about, but uh, it wasn't anything scientific. Uh, the announcement of the Big Bang ripples observed by the Kobe satellite cosmic background explorer. Uh, he made this statement to the New York Times on, on the front page. It's like looking at God. Pretty, uh, pretty strong statement. Now, um, a week later in the Los Angeles Times, a pretty good science historian, Frederick Burnham, put it this way. These findings now available make the idea that God created the universe a more respectable hypothesis now than at any time in the last 100 years. Let's go back to this question. Is the Big Bang Theory a Christian conspiracy? Jeffrey Burbage, a um, famous British um, uh, astronomer, was one of the tiny number of scientists rejecting the Kobe conclusions, uh, rejecting the, the, the Big Bang implications. And um, to the end, he believed the universe to be infinitely old. Uh, he discounted the Kobe observations in quite an interesting way. He said they came from the first church of Christ of the Big Bang. Now, uh, poor Smoot, uh, uh, George Smoot, uh, had to respond to this, and he did. He called a press conference, so I said, I want to be very clear that neither I nor any member of my research team has any association whatsoever with the first church of Christ of the Big Bang. So that was settled. The whole team could agree on that. Burbage uh, favored the steady state hypothesis, a theory that he said supports Hinduism, not Christianity. George Smoot, in his book, Wrinkles in Time, you know, this book made a lot of money for George Smoot before he got the Nobel Prize, which is good. But he doesn't talk in this book about the thing that made him so famous at MIT. <laughs> very, very disappointing, very disappointing. This is his take on this. There is no doubt a parallel between the Big Bang as an, an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. So there's several opinions about these things. Uh, Charles Bennett, the, uh, uh, the uh, group leader uh, for the Wilkinson probe, Wilkinson uh, micro microwave anisotropy probe, and these are later experiments uh, uh, beginning nine years later, and, and actually going on today, uh, and he says this about his experiments. It has now uh, mapped the temperature variations, or anisotropy, of the cosmic microwave background radiation over the full sky with unprecedented accuracy and precision. Uh, what is all this uh, let's talk about? Well, uh, if you get a long, long way away from anything uh, in, our, in our universe, like, I don't know, thousand miles from the next molecule, okay, this is a long way away, uh, the background temperature is not absolute zero, as it might be expected to be in, a, in an infinitely old universe. It's around 2.7 degrees Kelvin, about 2.7 ab degrees absolute temperature, but it's not that everywhere. It, it, it has ripples. I mentioned the Big Bang ripples or undulations or waves, many ways you could describe this. And the reason that all these experiments um, help to confirm the Big Bang Theory is the Big Bang Theory produces 
before observation exactly the nature of these, these ripples. Bertrand Schwarzkopf, Physics Today, his articles called New Cosmic Microwave Background Results Strengthen the Case for Inflationary Big Bang Cosmology. And, and this is what I said before. These temperatures are not absolute zero. They're around 2.7 degrees Kelvin with variations, which are predicted beautifully well by the Big Bang Theory. Adrian Cho, article in Science, says, is uh, uh, called long-awaited data sharpens picture of the universe's birth. So the universe does indeed seem to have a birth. Oh, this is, an, this is a nice figure. It's due to Alan Guth. We'll talk about him a little bit too. And um, over on the left-hand side is the beginning uh, with things like inflation going on in a real hurry. And, and over on the right-hand side is, is we, 13.7 uh, billion years ago. So that, I like this, uh, this figure and uh, we can, you know, um, now, what does all this mean? Well, by, net, by definition, time is that dimension in which cause and effect phenomena take place. No time, no cause and effect. Thus, time's beginning is concurrent with the beginning of our universe. And as the space-time theorem says, and Hawking had a lot to do with that, it follows that the cause of the universe must be some entity operating in a time dimension completely independent of and pre-existent to the time dimension of our cosmos. This conclusion is important to our understanding of who God is and who God is not. It tells us that the Creator is transcendent, operating beyond the dimensional limits of our universe. It tells us that God is not the universe itself, nor is God contained within the universe. And some of you are saying, well, I never thought either, either of those things, but there are a couple billion people in the world that think uh, one or both of these things, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's significant. Um, Leon Letterman, Nobel Prize winner in physics, 1988. Uh, well, let me go back to Stephen Hawking for a second. Stephen Hawking wrote this amazing book, A Brief History of Time, which has sold more than 20 million copies. Uh, that's never happened before about a, in a book about science. It probably won't ever happen again. Uh, but a lot of famous physicists decided, you know, this would be a great way to improve our retirement situation. <laughs> and uh, one of these was Leon Letterman, who I'm sure said, I'm, I'm more famous than Hawking, or at least I, I was at that time. I'm going to write my own book and call it The God Particle. If that won't sell, nothing will. Well, I don't think this book is very good. Um, you don't need to tell Professor Letterman that. He's still living. Uh, the, and the most unusual thing about the book is though the, the introduction is completely different from the book. In fact, one even wonders who wrote the introduction. But it's wonderful, and so I'll share it with you. Leon Letterman agreed to put his name on this uh, introduction. Either he or somebody else said in the very beginning there was a void, a curious form of vacuum, a nothingness containing no space, no time, no matter. No light, no sound, and yet the laws of nature were in place, and this curious vacuum held potential. A story logically begins at the beginning, but this story is about the universe, and unfortunately there are no data for the very beginning, earlier than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. None, zero. I put this in red. He has it in italics. Uh, we don't know anything about the universe until it reaches the mature age of a billionth of a trillionth of a second. That is very, some very short time after the creation in the Big Bang. When you read or hear uh, anything about the birth of the universe, somebody is making it up. We are in the realm of philosophy. Only God knows what happened at the very beginning. Uh, Leon Letterman, The God Particle. Uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, yes, that's his book. Um, Stephen Hawking. Okay. Uh, shortly after his book, a Brief History of Time uh, was published. He made this statement, the actual point of creation, you'll see he's assuming a point of creation, lies outside the scope of the presently known laws of physics. And Alan Guth, more or less his North American counterpart, uh, said that the instant of creation remains unexplained. How did we get to this remarkable singularity of near infinite temperature, pressure, and so on, all these things? How did, how did that happen? Oh, here's Alan Guth in his office. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Some of you who are not scientists think that scientists are very orderly, and some of them are, uh, but not all. Alan Guth always claimed that within 20 seconds he could find any item in his room. Uh, but these piles, this picture is at least five years old, and these piles are much higher now. And, uh, <laughs> and I think the main purpose of these, these piles at this point is to keep reporters away. There's really no place for them to, to sit in his office. Uh, now, I think many people know here that Stephen Hawking died this year on March 14th. He was the best known scientist in the world. I think nobody was even, even close. Um, worth 20 million, despite staggering medical expenses, including round-the-clock professional care for 25 years. It was very fortunate that he wrote this book that made him a millionaire because he needed a lot of help. This is my favorite picture of him. This is about, uh, yeah, this is about 10 years old, and uh, it's, uh, you know, he's, he was, what, 65 when this picture was taken, and he looks to be about 40, yeah, in this picture. So this, this is, this is my favorite. His office is very tidy, uh, as you can see. Um, now, let's go back a little bit to Hawking's original research at Cambridge University. It was jointly with Roger Penrose and George Ellis. Both, all three became very famous. They demonstrated that every solution to the equations of general relativity guarantees the existence of a singular boundary for space and time in the past. This result is now known as the Singularity Theorem. Um, 1974, Hawking is on his own, doing great things. Paper on the quantum evaporation of black holes, exploding back black holes, Hawking radiation, and, and so on. So really, just a brilliant career. Here's a picture. You know, people sometimes like to see pictures. I, I like this picture. This is a, a, a black hole. A black hole is a spiraling thing. Uh, ripping matter from a companion star. Now, this is not a photograph, okay? This is a computer simulation. Nobody has ever seen with a telescope or anything of the sort a black hole. We, we are very confident they exist from indirect evidence, but uh, this is a pretty, I think this is a pretty good representation of what it must be like. Stephen Hawking was surely the most famous physicist in history who did not win the Nobel Prize. I think five or six years ago, the Nobel Committee put out a, a two-page explanation for why he didn't get the Nobel Prize. Um, that's not bad, actually. Uh, the reason, and what they said, is that the Swedish Royal Academy demands that an award-winning discovery must be supported by verifiable experimental or observational evidence. Hawking's work uh, remains unproved, uh, although the mathematics of his theory theories is um, is definitely beautiful and elegant. Science waited until 1995 for rock solid evidence for the existence of black holes. The verification of Hawking radiation or any of his more radical theoretical proposals still seems far off. Now, even if some aspects of his research turn out to be wrong, and uh, if you've been around in science long enough, you've done something that's wrong, uh, he'll have had a profound impact on the history of scientific thought. Now, this is from this movie, The Theory of Everything, and it's amazing. Uh, this guy, Eddie uh, Redmine, got the Best Actor Award for his portrayal, and, and it's, now I think the actor, I think he looks like Harry Potter myself. <laughs> uh, but he has got himself dolled up to look almost exactly like Hawking. In fact, you can, uh, yeah, in the, uh, do, I, do I have a pointer, Richard? Uh, I, and I don't have, have it right now, but in, anyway, in this one down here in the in the bottom right is the is definitely Eddie Redmine. Uh, this one I can't even tell. Uh, the yellow. Yeah, maybe the yellow one. Let's see. Yeah, let me see if I can point to this. I can't even. I honestly can't tell. Maybe maybe some of you have watched this movie more times than I have. Uh, yeah, this. I'm not sure about this one. I guess it's the actor, I, I, but I can't bet my life on it. This guy is an amazing actor, and of course it made uh, Hawking even more famous than he was um, already. And uh, I have one more picture from this. This is where they're all getting together. Uh, the actor, 
and uh, Felicity Jones and uh, Stephen Hawking's first wife, Jane Wilde. I'll say more about him, her, and, uh, and Stephen Hawking. Okay, so yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a nice story. Okay, um, New Year's Eve, 1962, they meet. Stephen Hawking meets Jane Wilde at a party. One month later, he's diagnosed with amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis, ALS, and given two years to live, a pretty depressing situation. And he was kind of an average student at Cambridge University. Um, that's not bad. <laughs> average students at Cambridge University are pretty good. Uh, but he was, um, you know, he spent a lot of his time doing non-scientific things, which we don't need to talk about. Uh, uh, let's go to his biographers, uh, uh, Michael uh, White and John Grimm, see what they say. They say, there is little doubt that Jane Wilde's appearance on the scene was a major turning point in Hawking's life. The two of them began to see a lot more of one another and a strong relationship developed. It was finding Jane Wilde that enabled him to break out of his depression and regenerate some belief in his life and work. For Hawking, his engagement to Jane Wilde was probably the most important thing that had ever happened to him. It changed his life, gave him something to live for, and made him determined to live. Without the help that Jane Wilde gave him, he almost certainly would not have been able to carry on or had the will to do so. Uh, they married, he had, was given uh, a sentence of two years to live uh, on that New Year's Eve, and uh, he's getting married two and a half years later, so obviously he's still alive. They had three children subsequently, so no, no doubt about it. Uh, here's the picture. He's got a cane already, but this is, this is a wonderful uh, Wonderful photograph. We could talk about each one of these parents, but we don't have time. They're all interesting. Uh, Mrs. Hawking, probably the most interesting of all. Um, his statement, what really made a difference in my life is that I got engaged to a woman named Jane Wilde. This gave me something to live for. Now, Jane Hawking, just after the um, uh, Brief History of Time was, was published and, and their financial future became secure. Um, talk to the press about this. Now, Jane Hawking has a PhD of her own in the medieval lyric poetry of, the, uh, of Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's written a wonderful book called Music to Move the Stars. She's, she's a lover of music. and. Um, and of course, she lived with Stephen Hawking for many years. Uh, Jane Hawking is a Christian. She said at the time of the publication of A Brief History of Time, without my faith in God, I wouldn't have been able to live in this situation. I wouldn't have been able to marry Stephen in the first place because I wouldn't have had the optimism to carry me through and I wouldn't be able to carry on without it. Her keeping him alive with a minimal income is uh, truly amazing. Now. Why did this book sell 20 million copies? And it's still selling them. I've got the illustrated version now. Uh, it, it's, um, it's more interesting than the one that's not illustrated. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the reason for Stephen Hawking's amazing success, not just as a scientist, but as a popularizer of science, is that he addresses the problems of meaning and purpose that concern all thinking people. The book overlaps with Christian belief. Both of his wives were Christians and does so deliberately, but graciously and without rancor. It's an important book, needs to be treated with respect and attention. Uh, now, there is a main character in the brief history of time, and let me show you where the main character is introduced. It's on about page 40. Okay, I wish I'd brought my own old copy of, of the book. Uh, it's pretty marked up. He says, it is difficult to discuss the beginning of the universe without mentioning the concept of God. So here's the main character. My work on the origin of the universe is on the borderline between science and religion, but I try to stay on the scientific side of the border. It is quite possible that God acts in ways that cannot be described by scientific law. So he's looking pretty sympathetic to, uh, to uh, spiritual things here. Um, and uh, shortly thereafter, I thought I'd left the question of the existence of a supreme being completely open, be perfectly consistent with all we know to say that there was a being who was responsible for all the laws of physics. This is his article in The American Scientist. 
Um, and Hawking was asked about this many times, asked, uh, for example, in one situation, whether science and Christianity were competing philosophy. He said, well, that couldn't possibly be. If that were true, then Newton would not have discovered the law of gravity, knowing Newton to be a, uh, a Christian. Brief history of time makes some intentionally ambiguous statements that I think are wonderful. Here's one. Even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe to describe them? This is a good question. I've taught a, a, a freshman seminar, just a one unit course at, at my university for many, many years on a brief history of time. And, and, uh, and I asked them at the end of the in final exam, what's the answer to this? And I get a lot of interesting answers. Um, uh, this one, uh, uh, this, is, this is a play on Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein never liked quantum mechanics, even though he explained the photoelectric effect using some kind of quantum ideas. Never liked, and uh, he didn't like the um, probabilistic nature of, of quantum. I argued with Niels Bohr on and on and on and on many, many years. In fact, at one conference, I think things were getting a little bit, uh, a little bit sleepy, and uh, the, the uh, person in charge of the conference asked uh, Professor Einstein, um, what do you think about quantum mechanics? And he responded, as apparently he did quite often, that God does not play b dice with the universe. And Hawking is disagreeing with him. He said, God not only plays dice, he sometimes throws them where they can't be seen. Now, this is my favorite. Oh, okay. uh, Hawking s seems to like uh, or, or at least in his writings, like St. Augustine. And this is, he raises an issue that's, that's uh, out there today. And the idea that God might want to change his mind. And Hawking says, no, it's an example of the fallacy pointed out by St. Augustine, Augustine, of imagining time as a being existing in time. Time is a property only of, and now you're going to see a tremendous sense of humor here. Uh, time is a property only of the universe that God created, presumably he knew what he intended when he set it up, exclamation mark. Great. So a lot of good things uh, in, uh, in, in this book. Oh, and he's had, he had, he's no longer with us, had a, uh, quite a full life. Here he is in 2007 at zero gravity. You imagine a person who hasn't been able to walk for uh, more than 20 years uh, being in zero gravity. Pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, and I say accepting his disability, he had a very adventurous life. Now, in his book, A Brief History of Time, and until about 2010, Stephen Hawking seemed to be friendly toward belief in God. He liked St. Augustine, even going to church occasionally with his, with his first wife. Uh, acquiring the second wife was sufficiently controversial that she went to church by herself. Um, and... Um, uh, but four years ago, almost exactly four years ago, in the Canary Islands, he stated that he changed his mind. He's, his exact statement, I am an atheist. And I'm really, you know, I've asked a bunch of people. Now, George Ellis is a good friend of mine. We'll bring him up a little bit later. And he'll try to explain this sta statement for us, or at least it's what he told me in Munich last summer. Um, now, impossibility of a bouncing universe. When uh, the Big Bang Theory uh, really took over in the minds of most cosmologists, uh, naturally, atheists were eager to find some way to make the universe infinitely old. And perhaps the most promising of all the ideas that was put forth was the infinitely oscillating theory of the universe. That is to say, there was a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, but that was preceded by a big crunch and another Big Bang, and we're just in the midst of billions and billions of billions of big bangs and big crunches. Alan Guth showed that that can't be, and it's right in his title, The Impossibility of a Bouncing Universe, published again in Nature, 83, showed that even if the universe contains enough mass to halt its current expansion, any ultimate collapse would end in a thud, not a bounce. So the end of the infinitely oscillating uh, theory of the universe. Uh, 1998, two uh, observational research teams independently made the startling announcement that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Saul Perlmutter at, at Berkeley, Brian Schmidt at the Australian National University, uh, 
they got the Nobel Prize for this in 2014. So, um, yeah, so there isn't any big crunch coming. It's just the universe is just going to expand forever, humanly speaking. Alan Lightman has uh, made a study of what great cosmologists think, and uh, it's in this uh, book of his, uh, Lives and Worlds of Modern Cosmologists. Now, this, is, this seems like a contradiction in terms. You know, I, I, was an, I still am a nerd. I was an MIT nerd. I still am. We didn't have anything to do with Harvard. You know, for an MIT professor publishing the Harvard University Press, I mean, this is, this is treason. I guess nobody else would take it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They, Harvard young people said things about us, we said things about them. Uh, and this is his bottom line in this discussion. He says, uh, Lightman says, indeed, contrary to popular myth, this is a myth many of you have heard. The young man I came in and sat next to us has heard this myth. Science has, uh, uh, has disproved God. Indeed, contrary to, uh, to popular myth, scientists appear to have the same range of attitudes about religious matters as does the general public. What everyone thinks about God, it doesn't have too much to do with whether one has a PhD in the sciences or not. Uh, Charlie Towns was a friend of mine, uh, maybe the greatest uh, experimental scientist of the, of the 20th century. There's a sense in which, um, now I've got to be careful, or Professor Spitzer's going to kick me right out of here. Uh, uh, you know, you gave me an hour, and that did not include all that stuff that came beforehand. <laughs> I didn't know any of that was coming. I'm innocent of it all. Uh, Charlie Towns, anyway, I've known Charlie for a long time. Great, uh, great, great scientist, and uh, discovered the laser. This is from his book, Making Waves. That, Charlie Towns was the most fun, uh, humble people I ever knew, and so making, making waves means making lasers. He says, in my view, the question of origin seems always left unanswered if we explore from a scientific view alone. Thus, I believe there is a need for some religious or metaphysical explanation. I believe in the concept of God and in his existence. And in this book, which I think I give the title of down there, uh, there's a lot about his life as a member of the Christian community in, in uh, Berkeley, especially in this last chapter. Spiritual views from a scientific base. Charlie Towns, probably the most outstanding experimental scientist of the 20th century. Arthur Shalow, uh, one of my teachers at, uh, at Stanford. Was he still teaching when you were there? Yeah, uh, Shalow was quite a remarkable guy. He was, um, he was a, a very nearly spherical. <laughs> he was about that tall, about that wide. <laughs> about that thick. And some of you have heard that large people are unhappy. He was the most joyful person in the physics department at Stanford, maybe the most joyful person. So it's not true. Large people can be very joyful. Uh, and this is his statement. And this requires a little bit of interpretation. He says, we're fortunate to have the Bible, and especially the New Testament, which tells us so much about God in widely accessible human terms. He's contrasting this with his own work in molecular spectroscopy, which was telling us something about God, but not in very widely accessible human terms. He's contrasting his own research with the New Testament uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, I think. Identifies himself as a Christian. Uh, George Ellis, I know pretty well. Um, George Ellis was a, uh, uh, still is a professor of applied math that uh, we actually, when you know somebody really well, you've submitted a grant proposal with them, okay? <laughs> we have submitted a grant proposal with George Ellis. And uh, I already told you that uh, he and Hawking and Roger Penrose were responsible for this, this great work early on, co-authored with Stephen Hawking, the classic book, The Large Scale Structure of Space Time. Now, The Large Scale Structure of Space Time has sold um, about 1,000 copies. <laughs> so this has a lot of equations in it. Hawking was told before he published his book. Every equation you have in the book will decrease the sales by a factor of two. Uh, there are a lot of equations in this book, but it's wonderful. So I know George pretty well from a couple visits in uh, South, South Africa and, and um, summer before last in Germany. This is his statement. God's nature is revealed most perfectly in the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth as recorded in the New Testament. I asked George New, Hawking since whenever, and I asked him, why do you think 
uh, Hawking came out and said he was an atheist a couple years ago. He said, no, it's just, you know, his life was difficult. And, uh, you know, that's as close to an answer as I've heard. John Polkinghorne, the other professor of theoretical physics at Cambridge, um, for many of the same years as Hawking, later president of Queen's College in Cambridge, he says, I take God very seriously indeed. I am a Christian believer and believe that God exists and has made himself known in human terms in Jesus Christ. John Barrow, I know John Barrow too. Some of these people I know pretty well. I know John Barrow from, um, he used to, he, I knew him when he was a, or I first met him when he was a, a young faculty member at the University of Sussex, near Brighton, England. And uh, he used to come to Berkeley every January and February. And he was, he's a very modest individual. And uh, he would meet with the Christian faculty group that met once a week for lunch. And uh, it took a long time to figure out he was a cosmologist. And, uh, and finally, I said, yeah, but there's one thing unusual about you, John. Why do you always show up in January and February? He said to me, have you ever been in England in January and February? <laughs> uh, this is his statement when he got a prize worth a million dollars. I certainly don't believe there's some fundamental difference or conflict between a theistic or Christian perspective on the world and the practice of science. John Barrow as a member of the Reformed Church in Cambridge. He's the person that wrote the book on the fine-tuning of the universe, which we're not gonna have time to talk about. Um, Alan Sandage, probably the greatest observational cosmologist of the last third of the 20th century. Never got the Nobel Prize, very few astronomers do. Uh, he did get this little prize, the Crawford Prize, worth half a million dollars from Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And uh, this is what he says in this book I alluded to already, Origins. He says, he's asked the question in the book, can a person be a scientist and also be a Christian? He says, I am. And then he goes on to explain why, which is quite interesting. He says, yes, I am. He says, the world is too complicated in all its parts and interconnections to be due to chance alone. I'm convinced that the existence of life with all its order in each of its organisms is simply too well put together. That's one of the answers to your question you raised. Okay, all right. Uh, this isn't the way it should have been. I mean, he, he should be down in Chile in one of these amazing observatories in the Atacama Desert where, you know, it never rains, there's never any smog in the air. He should have been taking his telescope time, walked out to get some fresh air, looked up in the, in the natural sky and said, oh, well, this is too good to be true. God must have done it. No, his answer is, biology made me do it. <laughs> biology made me do it. Here's Don Page. He's a, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, just like me, a true nerd. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there's, a, there's a, a steep pyramid associated with good looks of human beings, <laughs> and, and another steep pyramid associated with uh, intelligence for scientific purposes, and they rarely intersect. <laughs> this I speak from experience. Uh, Don Page, this is a statement you can find in physics textbooks by Don. Um, uh, he says, I'm a conservative Christian in the sense of pretty much taking the Bible seriously for what it says. Of course, I know that certain parts are not intended to be read literally, so I'm not precisely a literalist, but I try to believe in the meaning I think it is intended to have. That's a famous statement. I said, Don, get that. he invited me to give a lecture like this at the University of Alberta some years back. And uh, I said, give me something I could, I could show people, students especially. Yeah. Stephen Hawking's um, most important collaborator and perhaps his closest personal friend lived with the Hawkings for three years while he was a postdoc in Cambridge. And this is what he gave me. He said, if the universe basically is very simple, the theological implications of this would need to be worked out. Perhaps the mathematical simplicity of the universe is a reflection of the personal simplicity of the gospel message that God sent his son Jesus Christ to bridge the gap between himself and each of us who have rejected God or rejected what he wants for us by rebelling against his will and disobeying him. This is a message simple enough even to be understood by children. Chris Isham. Professor of Theoretical Physics, Imperial College, London. Uh, he also invited me to speak there, and um, I did it, and I said to him, give me something good. Uh, he, he uh, Paul Davies, uh, who's a uh, popular science writer, 
describes Isham as Britain's greatest quantum gravity expert. That's a mouthful because Stephen Hawking is British and what he does is quantum gravity. We don't need to enter into that debate, but it is a significant compliment. And this is what he gave me. He said, the God of Christianity is not only the ground of being, uh, he is also incarnate. Uh, essential therein is the vis vision of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the new creation out of the old order and the profound notion of the redemption of time, not just a brief history of time, the redemption of time through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Now, the last sentence here, I have to caution you to, to not, not take out of context. Uh, Chris Isham is passionate about theoretical physics. He has committed his entire professional life to theory. He loves theoretical physics, but this is what he says. Whoops, did he say it? I guess he didn't say it on this slide. <laughs> he said, what I've found in Jesus Christ is more important than theoretical physics. I don't know how we lost that. Rick Smalley was a, a good friend of mine, father of nanotechnology. Um, I've no, I knew him since 1981 when he interviewed for a faculty position at Berkeley. We turned him down. He was too old. He was 31 years old. He'd, he'd, he'd uh, taken too long to get his PhD. <laughs> well, we were wrong, needless to say. And uh, he uh, became the father of nanotechnology, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996. Rick was a very determined atheist. He knew I was a Christian, and at every opportunity, he would explain to me that I was wrong. Uh, until about five years before he passed, and he explains this here. He says, recently, I've gone back to church regularly, at the Second Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. Uh, he, he would not have entered a, the door of a church for anything in the world. So things have changed. It has a new focus to understand as best I can what it is that makes Christianity so vital and powerful in the lives of billions of people today, even though almost 2,000 years have passed since the death and resurrection of Christ. Although I suspect I'll never fully understand. I now think the answer is very simple. It is true. And he continues, God did create the universe about 13.7 billion years ago, and of necessity has involved himself with his creation ever since. The purpose of this universe is something that only God knows for sure, but it is increasingly clear to modern science that the universe was exquisitely fine-tuned to enable human life. We are somewhat, somehow critically involved in, in his purpose. And now this gets a little squishy theologically. I, I know there's some, uh, some preachers here, and uh, I'm not necessarily endorse, endorsing this last sentence, but it's interesting. He says, our job is to sense that purpose as best we can, love one another, and help God get the job done. <laughs> uh, his life was changed by Jesus Christ, radically changed. Uh, now I'm getting near my conclusions. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to finish. This is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> You, you never know when this gets started. I can tell a lot of stories, and, uh, and, and, and some of them are true. Uh, the, uh, I'm of the, of, of the school that believes that any good story is worthy of a little embellishment. Okay, now let's get serious. Uh, one comment here, and then seven final comments. The Big Bang represents an immensely powerful, yet carefully uh, planned and controlled release of matter, energy, space, and time. All this is accomplished within the strict confines of the very carefully fine-tuned laws, uh, physical constants and laws. The power, and this is important, the last sentence here, the power and care this explosion reveals exceed human mental capacity by many, many orders of magnitude. So my seven points. Um, where do we go from here? Well, this is where I go from here, and uh, we, we, can, we can discuss this as long as, as um, if people want to afterwards. Um, first, a creator must exist. The Big Bang ripples and the Wilkinson probe are clearly pointing to an ex nihilo creation consistent with the first few verses of the book of Genesis. Two, this creator must have awesome wisdom and power. The quantity of material and the power resources within our universe are truly immense. The information or intricacy manifest in any part of the universe, and especially in a living organism, as, as uh, Alan Sandage well said, is beyond our ability to comprehend. And what we do see is only what God has shown us within our own four dimensions of space and time. 
Third, this creator is loving. The simplicity, balance, order, elegance, and beauty seen throughout the creation is uh, demonstrate that God is loving rather than capricious. Fourth, this creator is just and requires justice. Inward reflection and outward investigation confirm that human beings have a conscience. The conscience reflects the reality of right and wrong and the necessity of obedience. Each of us falls hopelessly short of the creator's standard. Uh, perhaps the most obvious characteristic of humankind is selfishness, truly universal. Who can keep his or her thoughts and attitudes pure for even an hour? Benjamin Franklin, in his autobiography, talks about this. He's 17 years old, and he decides he's going to be good for the rest of his life. He's, uh, you know, he's, he, he's not going to do bad things anymore. Uh, he's not going to sin. And uh, so he starts out on this path, and, and it's not going too terribly well. And uh, he says, I've taken the wrong time interval. The right time interval is not my life, it's a year. He starts out on that path. Well, that's not working either. Let's do it for a month, a week, a day. And finally, he, it, it wasn't working. It, uh, it, it just didn't work. Who can keep his or her attitudes and thoughts pure for even an hour? And if each person falls short of his or her own standards, how much more so those of an all-holy God? Because this creator is loving, wise, and powerful, he made a way to rescue us. When we come to a point of concern about our personal failings, we can begin to understand from the creation around us that God's love, wisdom, and power are sufficient to deliver us from our otherwise hopeless situation, seventh and last. If we trust our lives totally to the rescuer, Jesus Christ, we will be saved. The one and only attempt path to, uh, is to give up all human attempts to satisfy God's requirements and put our trust solely in Jesus Christ and in his means of redemption, namely his death on the cross. Thank you very much.